It's called the Great Barrier Reef, but for how much longer? Stretching 2,300 kilometers along the Australian coast, some 3,000 coral reefs make up a submerged continent so vast that it is visible from space. But this ecosystem, one of the world's richest, is also one of its most endangered. So much so that we seriously wonder whether this Great Barrier Reef, which is synonymous with splendor and amazement in our imagination, is still worthy of its name. The start of 2017 marks the departure of Fleur de Passion on the second half of its voyage around the world in Magellan's Wake. In this setting, the Ocean Mapping Expedition starts a new chapter of its mission to map humanity's impact on the oceans. In partnership with the University of Queensland in Brisbane, two new scientific programs are about to be launched to study an unfolding tragedy. The bleaching of the coral, triggered by global warming. They are being conducted in addition to the other programs underway since the expedition departed Seville in April 2015, measuring the noise and the microplastic pollutions of the oceans. This mission to the coral reefs begins in late March, just off Stradbroke Island in Moreton Bay near Brisbane. On the deck of the sailboat, a team from Coral Watch briefs the crew. They are learning about the protocol developed by this Australian NGO for observing the state of health of the reefs. At the moment on the Great Barrier Reef, there's a lot of stress from very warm water, which has been here for many months. So the water now is 27 degrees, right where we are. It should be more like 24 degrees. And this warm water stresses the coral, so it releases its symbiotic algae and goes from green and brown to white. And that's why it's called bleaching, because it looks literally as if it's been bleached. For the first time, two years in a row, we're having massive coral bleach. This is uh, unfortunate for Australia. We will lose a lot of reef again. For some other countries in the world, it's more than unfortunate because they rely on their reef for protein, for their livelihood, for living. And if their reefs disappear, they've got nowhere to, to eat. So it's, it's a real problem for countries such as Indonesia and the Philippine Coral Watch, which is the organization that we started uh, 15 years ago to look at the health of coral through the color. So you look at the color change from brown to white, and you can monitor the health. The Coral Watch system is, has been taken on board by the, the Fleur de Passion. Uh, and this is great because the Fleur de Passion will go up the Great Barrier Reef and we'll be able to look at the corals as uh, the ship moves north uh, and gather data. The journey north contends with some fairly bad weather. At the end of March, Tropical Cyclone Debbie batters the Queensland coast. And when Fleur de Passion sets sail in early April, after waiting for a few days, the crew still has to cope with heavy seas and repeated squalls. Please be aware that wind gusts can be 40% stronger than the average is given here. Maximum waves may be up to twice so high. As we approach the Swain Reefs, the weather calms down again and the mission to the Great Barrier Reef finally begins. In crystal clear water, the crew takes its first look at the state of the reefs. 
In this southern section, the corals are still well preserved. The shimmering colours and exuberant shapes live up to our idea of an underwater paradise. New to this setting, Pierre Baumgart uses PVC plates to immortalise his sketches, which will later become magnificent watercolour paintings and lithographs. From above and below the water, the Genevan animal painter reveals the most amazing encounters with the local fauna. En sortant de l'eau, moi j'avais dessiné pendant une heure et demie euh, dans le corail. J'étais assez fatigué, beaucoup d'émotions, beaucoup de fatigue. Et le courant était assez fort. Il fallait toujours lutter pour essayer de revenir face à mon sujet. J'avais deux trois coraux, des, des, un groupe de poissons que j'avais envie de représenter. Je vais toujours palmer, revenir, redescendre. Enfin, c'était assez fort. Et euh, après un moment, j'en avais vraiment assez physiquement, c'était très difficile. Donc je suis revenu euh, sur le Zodiac où nous attendait euh, Ifik. Et puis il y avait deux euh, sternes brunes, deux nodies, qui étaient posées sur le moteur à l'arrière du bateau. Il n'y avait absolument aucune peur euh, de l'être humain. Et ça, c'est quelque chose de très troublant. Donc j'ai pu reprendre mes plaques avec lesquelles j'avais dessiné, j'ai enlevé mes palmes, j'ai enlevé ma cagoule, j'ai enlevé mon masque. Je suis resté avec Ifik un petit moment sur le bateau et puis j'ai pu dessiner à 30 cm ces deux oiseaux qui étaient posés sur le moteur. Et ils s'envolaient, ils revenaient par moments et à un moment donné, euh, il y en a un qui s'est posé sur ma main. Et ça, ça a été un moment incroyable de, de se retrouver euh, loin de tout, donc l'horizon est marin, il y a, on n'est plus du tout près des côtes, on est à 200 km de la terre, on est en pleine mer, et un oiseau qui vient se poser sur sa main, ça c'est des moments juste hors du temps, c'est juste incroyable. Here I go out to see again The sunshine fills my head And dreams hang in the air whether under sail or at anchor, the team goes ahead with the two programs started since leaving Seville two years ago. The measurement of the ocean pollution by noise and microplastic. Off the coast of Townsville, the team collects its 90th seawater sample for the Micromega program. Yet again, the pouch reveals its lot of plastic particles to the naked eye. Once packaged, this sample, like all the previous ones, will go to Geneva for analysis by the biologists of the Ocean Eye Association. From Townsville onwards, the real highlight of this Australian leg of the expedition begins. The mapping of the Great Barrier Reef. Today, Alison, yeah. and then maybe, depending how it goes, this part this ambitious project involves some of Australia's leading oceanographic research institutions. Three teams of scientists from the Remote Sensing Research Centre of the University of Queensland take turns on board Fleur de Passion. Their task is to conduct photographic surveys of some 20 reefs over an area of 400 kilometres. Once or twice daily throughout the month of May, the researchers go into the water to perform their meticulous and exhausting task on each of the selected reefs. Well, uh, while here on the reef, at every reef we're going with the Fleur de Pachon, we basically uh, do what we call transect surveys, photo transect surveys. A diver goes in the water, or a snorkeler uh, in this case, and the snorkeler uh, tows uh, float with uh, GPS in here and the GPS is recording our position. At the same time the snorkel is taking photos of the seabed and by doing that at regular intervals we can get a good picture in real time of what's on the reef. Then back in the office they analyze each photo for the composition of how much coral and algae and line it up with our uh, maps. So that's one activity we're doing. Currently, uh, there is no map of the Great Barrier Reef that shows the composition of uh, coral and algae uh, 
or the different geomorphic zonations of every individual reef. If you realize that the Great Barrier Reef is 3,000 reefs in total, uh, stretching over 2,300 kilometers, then that's a big effort to, to do that. Therefore, we are using a combination of satellite imagery, um, field data, and ecological modeling and mapping methods to create these maps. These maps will be used for uh, Great Barrier Reef Park uh, organizations, scientists, and anybody who's uh, involved in management and monitoring of the reef to, for instance, better plan where uh, to do crown of thorn monitoring or where to focus uh, marine park zonation on or where uh, have tourist activities. All these data sets are presently not available. Uh, we do know where the reef is, we can see it from space, but we, we have no map like we have for the forest that describes what you can find in there. If you don't know exactly what you got, then it's also harder to manage uh, what you gain or what you lose in case there is a major impact happening. The researchers from the University of Queensland will take 12,000 photos of the seabed along 59 transects covering 17 reefs altogether. These pictures are now available online for the benefit of the scientific community and anyone wishing to consult and use them. As much as circumstances permit, Fleur de Passion moves from reef to reef under sail. On deck, alongside the regular crew, everyone becomes a crew member and pitches in to help with the handling of the vessel. Chris the scientist and Salty the chief diver, Malcolm an Australian who boarded the boat in Townsville as a passenger for a week, or Leandro, a Genevan teenager from the socio-educational program Youth at Sea. This is also a facet of the ocean mapping expedition, an adventure open to anyone who wishes to embark. Wind and sea conditions do get rougher sometimes, and at such times, it's all hands on deck for this micro-society, all pulling together to help with the operations. Whenever at anchor, while the Australian researchers do their photo transects, the Fleur de Passion team keeps observing the health of the corals. In this northern part of the Great Barrier Reef, the findings are much more alarming than in the south. White death lurks everywhere. Ellison Reef, in stark contrast to the colourful splendour of the south, offers up a sad vision of partly or completely bleached corals. There are still some splashes of colour. Some fish seem to be clinging to the faintest hope. After all, bleached corals are not yet dead. But if these animals from the family of polyps are to survive a bleaching episode, there has to be a drop in the water temperature during the next few weeks. Elsewhere, ghost-like forests of dead branching corals make for some dismal scenes. They leave no doubt as to the fate of the Great Barrier Reef if global warming continues. And if global warming were not enough, monstrous crown of thorn starfish reaching up to 80 centimetres in size are proliferating and wreaking havoc on the corals. May 2017 comes to an end. So too does the dramatic and exhilarating two-month mission for the ocean mapping expedition and the crew of Fleur de Passion. At the end of June, the sailboat left Cairns for the Solomon Islands, continuing towards Papua New Guinea, Indonesia and the Philippines. The expedition is drawing irresistibly closer to the renowned Spice Islands. What was Magellan's sought-after destination is today the theatre of major environmental problems. This will be the subject of our next episode. <laughs>